So um, this is the third lecture. I would like to quickly revise. Well, I would like to make some announcement. Uh, I think that Hugo has just sent uh, the, the link to my webpage where you can download the transparencies. They will be uploaded every day after the lecture. This is the last uh, version uh, after the lecture of yesterday. And, but I cannot send it by email because it's 24 megabytes. So, but with the link, you can see them directly. And um, also the, the, the lectures will be online, I think, uh, open, right? And yeah. So let's start with the third lecture. I would like to revise quickly what we did yesterday, just to keep it, uh, to, 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 to remind what we were doing, and then to see what is the advantage of using these weak dual solutions, okay? So there's a clear advantage, and uh, then I will explain it at the blackboard. I will make a couple of proofs. So this is the standard problem that we were tackling, tackling since the first day. And this is the dual formulation. So basically, you apply L minus 1, which is this formula, is the, 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 the formula with the green function, OK? The standard green function for the Laplacian, but also for other operators. And uh, this dual formulation encodes already the, 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 the boundary, the lateral boundary condition. So we don't have to worry about the boundary condition anymore. Okay, this formulation has been used before by Pierre and Baskets on the whole space. And uh, I don't know if it was used before in the bounded domain, but anyway, it's the same idea. Hmm? And it's very useful, for example, in RN to prove the uniqueness of measure data problems. So if you take U0 to be not just a function, but the measure, for example, you want to prove the uniqueness of the fundamental solution, in which case U0 is a delta, this, this formulation is convenient, okay? So, uh, as I told you, after defining a lot of classes, we have seen that we can construct with dual solutions. With dual solutions are the weak solution corresponding to the dual problem. Nothing more than that. What is the advantage? You see, the, here you have uh, that the test function are just L infinity and they decay at the boundary as the first second function, say distance to some power. Okay, in the case of the Laplacian, distance to power one. So, that's it. This is the definition of, of weak solution and why this is so useful. And uh, basically, this is the minimal class of solutions that contains all the, all the solution that allows you to make a uh, nice computation, like comparison, like what you will see after. And uh, they provide a quite general, they are, sometimes they coincide with the very weak solution. So all the possible weak solutions except the distributional one, are included in this, uh, in this setup. In some other case, they don't. It depends on the operator. In the case of the Laplacian, you can say, you can think that this is just a way of rewriting the, um, the, the very weak solution or the distributional solution. You just use as a test function L minus one of psi and you use Fubini. Mm. Okay, that's it. And uh, it, this is the, 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 the formulation of the very weak solutions. So, uh, well, uh, if you want solution to the cauchy dirichlet problem, you have to prescribe initial data and you have to ask that they are continuous up to zero because they, you have to recover in some sense the initial data. Good. So, uh, I have told how, how they are built by approximation of easier class of solution. For example, I explained what the gradient flow is. I resumed here uh, and I put some references. Um, here is the Brazis Komura theorem that applies to this setting. I try to explain, and uh, the idea is that you can see when this, when you have these classes of uh, of approximants, say of th these good classes of solution. Gradient flow is treating this equation like if it was an infinite dimensional, uh, an infinite dimensional dynamical system or ODE, hmm? ordinary differential equation. So uh, when I have all of these results, well just when I check if this inequality is true. And this is called AVI, Evolutional Variational Inequality, and it's really easy to check. Here you can see the details, okay? It's just using Fubini, the dual equation, Young inequality. And I have existence of this class of solutions. An alternative approach that allows for, but is, uh, that relies on homogeneity, on pseudo homogeneity of the, of the nonlinearity. Here is written in the full generality. You can restrict yourself to the case u to the m if you want. Uh, then you have this result, which is due to Grandel and Pierre in JFA in 1982, uh, in which the monotonicity property that, we sh we, that I showed the first day how to prove is, um, 
is proven for the first time, also for these f, which are not exactly homogeneous. When I say not exactly homogeneous, I mean that they can be two powers, one at the origin and one at infinity. Okay, so we have good approximant. We can construct our, uh, okay, this is a reminder of how gradient flows are solved by means of uh, the implicit Euler scheme. And then here there is a proposition that says there's all these mild solution or semi group solution, either the H minus YS or the L1 are with dual solution. And this is an exercise essentially about density of test function here and there, okay? And for me. Uh, and then the theorem that I kind of explained you yesterday is that for any data in this space, there exists a unique solution, um, minimal in the sense that it is the nymph of the approximants which are monotone, okay? A unique solution which satisfies this property is continuous, it takes the initial data, uh, it satisfies the monotonicity, is a good solution to start to work with, okay? We can do computation and then it's essential the minimal one is unique and let me tell you that the problem of uniqueness in the class of very weak solution is very difficult very very difficult and uh, it's only partially solved and the result is the minimal one is unique but there can be others okay so this is the only point of this thing we are working on trying to prove contractivity in these spaces and uh, i can assure you that uh, indeed it's unique but this is still to be fixed with all the details. It's a bit technical. So, uh, what is the point of using these solutions? This solution allow you to prove this, which we call an almost representation formula. What does it mean? Well, first, we, we see that there is a kind of monotonicity of these norms, which are not really norms, but of these potentials. No? You see, there is a time monotonicity. Potential are naturally decreasing. And then, if you do the computation a bit smarter, you can arrive to this, which is a kind of representation formula. I will devote the, uh, the next uh, 10 minutes to explain you how to deduce this formula, so the proof of this formula. But let me tell you why it is not a representation formula. For, well, it is not a representation formula because on the, for example, on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, you have you at a certain time, which appears also in the middle term. So, it's not really, here you would like to have u0, not, which is the only thing that you really control, the initial data, but you don't have it. Anyway, this, uh, this, this formula is good enough to obtain, you see, upper estimate, you just have to estimate this integral, or lower estimate. And it works as if it was a representation formula. Hmm? Let me tell you uh, how to prove this, and let me switch now to the blackboard. Anyway, the sketch of the proof is at, in the next page. So let me anticipate and then I explain you the idea. The idea is to take the green function as a test function. Of course, it's not allowed. You have to approximate. But then I want to, to, to give you the heuristics of this. Hmm? Okay, so let me switch to the blackboard. And let me begin with this. No? How do you... <clears throat> Uh, get the idea of proving this formula. So let's say almost representation formula. Well, if you think of the equation, the equation is ut equal l u to the m. No? And so what is the idea? If you multiply this equation by a test function, let me tell you which is the test function. For now, assume that we can take the green function x, x0, uh, or better said, x is the variable and x0 is the, the, the point of the green function. You multiply both member for, uh, by g of dot x0 and you integrate in the x. You integrate in the x. Hmm? So what are we writing here? Well, this is exactly, uh, there is a minus here. Uh, this is exactly L minus one of L of U to the M with the minus in front of it. So this is just minus U to the M at time T at the point X zero. And you get a pointwise information. Here, what you have is just the potential L minus one of U T. This is what we have done. We would like to use this formula. We would like to use this formula, no? Uh, but uh, here there are problems of regularity of ut. So what do you do? Well, you say, we can integrate everything in time now. So we integrate in time here between, say, t0 and t1, which means integrating. 
sorry. Which means integrating in time between T0 and T1 also here, which means again integrating here also in time, which means here, which means here. But here, you can commute the, in, the two integrals. It's just again an interchange of integrals. So what you have here is L minus one of the integral between T0 and T1 hmm, of ut in dt. And this you can solve. And this is just L minus one of u at time T1 minus u at time T0 that we rewrite as what it is, u of T1 minus u of t0 green function x0 x dx and this is equal to this then i prefer to put the minus here and to write the following so we have that the integral of u to dm t x0 between t0 and t1 in dt is equal to the integral of u of t0 minus u of t1 g of x0 x dx. Of course, here the variable is t1 x and t0 say x. Okay? So now this is almost a representation formula. What do we need? We need to make this explicit because x0 is already fixed and it is the same x0 of the green function. Good, it's a pointwise information in space. We would like to have a pointwise information also in time. So what do you use now? Now you use the monotonicity and you say that these, oh, this is, uh, there is a function, remember, which is t to the one over m minus one u of tx, which for almost of x, uh, for almost all x, this function is monotone increasing. So here we can put the first value. So here you have u to the m, t0, x0, and then you compute the integral. And this is explicit. And here you have, this is less or equal than u to the m at time t1, x0, and then you compute the integral. And it's an explicit expression. I mean, it's t, you have to compute the integral of this guy between t0 and t1. And what you get after doing this uh, very easy computation is what I show you here now okay so i just show you how by simply multiplying by the green function and integrating in time you arrive to this formula and then you have to comp compute the blue integral you remember the monotonicity you compute the integral and you end up with this formula okay and this is really nice because you really have already whenever this integral is finite and look, we are, we are using, uh, for example, for the upper bound, we are using a negative solution. So you really just have to estimate the integral of u0 against the green function. And if u0 is in LP sufficiently high, automatically it's in an infinity. And this is what I'm going to show you in the uh, next, how to prove boundedness in two lines. Well, to have a rigorous proof of uh, boundedness in two lines, having this formula. So what is the rigorous proof? You want, to prove, you want to basically plug this as a test function, characteristic of a time interval times the green function. This is not admissible, so what do you have to do? Approximation. It takes five pages of approximation, but it can be done. It's an appendix in our works. It's really the work you have to do, but once you get the idea, you know that this is just wanting to test the equation with this. Let me say that we are not the first to to test with the green function. There are previous work by Del Pino, uh, by Del Pino and Dascalopoulos, also Caffarelli used it, but they never brought, they never used it in this way, let's say, no? I mean, testing with the green function basically means computing the potential. So, of course, we are not the first to compute the potential of something. Huh? This is what just a disclaimer. Anyway, uh, when you have this formula, what do you do? Well. When you have this formula, first thing you can do is prove the absolute bounds. I mean, there exists an absolute constant computable hmm, such that this is true. So the L infinity norm of the solution decays like this power for all t greater than zero. And constant K1 does not depend on U0. It depends on omega, on M, 
on S if you are doing the, the fractional Laplacian, but forget it for now. It depends on the dimension, on the power m, of course, it's just to be greater, greater than one, and on omega, but not on the initial datum. So every solution is uniformly bounded, absolutely and uniformly bounded, independent on the initial datum. And this is how you construct the friendly giant. We will arrive to that. Ask, um, but let, uh, may I ask but let me, see, tell me. This means, uh, regardless of U0, so even if U0 is super uh, large, this happens. Well, we will see that this proves the existence with U0 equal plus infinity, which is the friendly giant. But then we. So this is. It immediately goes down, even if there is finite speed of propagation. Immediately. Yes. Okay. I mean, this is, uh, if you want, it's an effect of the, it's an effect of the uh, convexity of the function there. Net, now, I pass to the blackboard because I really want to, to show you the proof of this, but... Uh, uh, sorry, Matteo. Si. Sorry, Matteo. But this is um, upper bound, it's okay if the initial data is bounded, right? No, 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 no. This is true. For, also for the initial data equal u0 equal plus infinity everywhere on omega and this is what i'm going to show you right now okay okay and, and this is a feature of the i don't electric. understand it but i believe you yes yes you will understand it because i will give you a proof <laughs> which is correct so okay, uh, <laughs> but uh, let me explain you also the heuristics in terms of elliptic equation which is something we are more familiar with. so let me pass to switch to the blackboard now and let me go one page down. So, heuristics about absolute bounds. Absolute bounds seems a bit surprising, I understand you, because also to me they were surprising the first time I saw them, but think of this equation. Minus Laplace uh, V, let me use V when I use the other notation, equal V to the power P. Here we are doing P equal one over M, which is less than one, okay? So, this equation, this equation satisfies Absolute bounds. How do you prove that this satisfies absolute bounds? Does it mean that the solution of this problem, that exists a constant C bar, only depending on the dimension and on omega, positive, such that the norm of V L infinity is just or equal to C. And this holds for all the solution. Well, there is uniqueness for the solution of the Cauchy, -Dirich, uh, of the Cauchy problem of the Dirichlet problem, sorry, associated to this sublin um, yeah, sublinear, uh, semilinear uh, elliptic equation, okay? And this is, and this is uh, basically, um, and this is basically made into steps. You do the yeah. Poser iteration and you prove that this is less than uh, a certain constant, the norm of B, L1, and then, you prove that the norm of VL1 is absolutely bounded. Okay, this is the standard Moser iteration, if you want, or you multiply it by the Green function. There is the centric that I'm telling you in the parabolic, they work also for the elliptic, and you dig it. Uh, so you prove first this, and then you prove that the norm of VL1 is less or equal than an absolute constant. How do you prove this? This is. Uh, uh, this is the um, this is the, the trick of having this power less than one hmm? because uh, um, because it happens exactly what uh, uh, what I'm going to explain to you now in the parabolic in the parabolic you take just t equal one and you get the result for the elliptic because you have separation of variable right so that's it. I mean, I will do a proof that explain you this, but this is a well-known fact when you have uh, uh, concave, say, nonlinearities here. And this is the prototype of the concave nonlinearity. Okay? So let me tell you what you deduce, deduce from the formula. So from this, from this formula, from this formula, let me rewrite it for you. So you have u of t0 x0 less or equal than uh, I write what you get by bringing the, 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 the times here on the right hand side and then you have 1 over t1 minus t0 and then you have the integral of u 
of t0 x minus u of t1 x, uh, sorry, u of x x0 dx. Hmm? So we are considering non-negative function. Okay, so which amounts just to require the, the initial data is non-negative. We have comparison. That's it. Uh, so this we can throw away. Hmm? So this is less or equal than zero. Good. But now we can choose t1. So let's choose t1 equal to t0. Hmm? And so we easily get the u of t0 x0 is less or equal. No, then this becomes a two. 2 to the m over m minus 1, uh, this is to the power m, and this to the power m, of course, divided by t, 0. Hmm? Integral of u of t0 x, g of x0 x dx. Okay? And now, let's start the proof. This is the consequence that we will use, the consequence of the almost representation formula that we will use to prove our upper bound, absolute upper bound. Hmm? Okay, so the first step is, is assume, first step, assume u0 is in LP with P greater than N over two. Hmm? Okay, and we will prove that if this is true, uh, then the estimate told, and then we will remove this hypothesis in step two. Okay, so we know that in this case also ut for all t belongs to the same LP. Hmm? This is LP stability. It can be done by noticing that this quantity is negative, and it is quite easy to show. Exercise for you. And then, then we observe that how that you can do other. So u of t times the green function, hmm? I'm doing the case of the Laplacian. Huh? So we take the green function as the green function of the minus Laplacian. So you have u of t g of x zero, I don't write the, the x variable, you use other. So this is less or equal than norm of u of t lp norm of g x zero p prime okay and here well since we know that g is less or equal than constant divided by x minus x zero to the n minus two we also know that it you can choose any p prime less than n over n minus two from which this condition is required so this is finite okay under this assumption this is finite but then what does this say you just use it here and you get and then this plus star star tell you that u to the m t0 x0 is less or equal than constant divided by t0 and then you have the new t norm lp oh but thanks to this property this is less or equal than the norm of u0 lp which is finite and then you have the norm of the green function at the point x0 which is also finite so your function now is in l infinity hmm? so this implies that u now u of t0 sorry this implies that u of t0 is bounded. Hmm? But now we want to see whenever u0 is in LP. Hmm? But now we want to do it for all data in uh, L1, uh, whatever. No? For all data, indeed, without any kind of restriction. So now you take two, take any u0 greater or equal than zero, any function. Say, since we are doing the theory in L1 with the weight phi1, say that u0 is to be non-negative and belong to this space, for example. But any other space would satisfy the same, um, the same, um, I mean, you can use the same trick I'm showing you now. Then what do you do? You take a sequence u0n, 
hmm? which is again the maximum between n and uh, u0. This monotonically converge uh, a sequence of uh, approximate, but this monotonically converge in L1 phi1 to your u0. Hmm? And this is in L infinity, so of course it is in LP. Hmm? So here, if you want, you're working with bounded solutions no? for all n. Then what happens? Then what happens? That, okay, for every n, you have this. So you have that for every n, you have that un of t, the, the, the result of the previous step holds. So you have the un of tx0 is less or equal, hmm? is less or equal than this. So then, a constant divided by t0, here there is an m, integral of u t0, hmm? and then the integral, uh, the green function, and the x. Now, since this is already in L infinity, we already know that it is bounded, we can say, oh, this is less than c, the norm of u of t0, L infinity. And then what you are Mateo, left... Mateo, with... sorry, Mateo, sorry. I think you are missing an N somewhere. Yes, there is an N everywhere. Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, and you do this, no? And this is finite. This. And this, well, what do you do? Well, this is finite, but only... Uh, but then what do you do? You soup in X0. This doesn't depend on x0, and then, so, what you get is that here you have a soup in x0. It's not difficult to check that this is less than a constant dependent on omega. This is, again, an exercise, okay? This is an L1 function uniformly in x0. I mean, basically, this is less or equal than the integral over omega, that 1 minus x minus x0 to the n minus 2. And if you have an s, 2s, who cares? It's the same. This is uniformly bounded for all x and x0. Hmm? This is less than SE omega. Hmm? That you can compute, actually. But now, what do you do? Oh, you notice that this is the norm of u of t0 at infinity to the power m. And then, here you get the simplification. And here you get the estimate. If you read what we have written, we have written the norm of un t0, L infinity, is less or equal than a constant independent of u0 is two times this integral, huh? divided by t0 to the power 1 over m minus 1. And that's it. And this is the proof. Ah, there is a problem. Here we still have un. Well, you use the lower semi-continuity of the norm, and which tells you that which tells you that the lim soup, if you want, of this, the limil, sorry. Oops, sorry. Sorry. Well, this estimate is uniform in N, so you can pass to the limit, but the, the oh, okay. But the limim of this is greater or equal than the limim, the, the, the limit. Okay, so use lower, lower semi-continuity of the infinity norm plus the uniform estimate, and you conclude the proof. And this is a rigorous proof. And it proves you, and also it gives you the idea of how big it is. This is like 2 to the m over m minus 1 times this integral. If you want, times the soup on x0 in omega of this integral, 1 over x minus x0 n minus 2 dx integral there over omega. And this is clearly finite and not depending on x0. And uh, not depending on u0, sorry. Hmm? And so this is the absolute bound. What do you do with this? Well, with this, you can construct the friendly giant. How? What is the friendly giant? Let's recall that the friendly giant is the solution of separation of variable utx which is solution to the elliptic problem. So minus Laplace S to the M equal C S hmm? divided by T to the one over M minus one. And this is a solution of separation of variable problem. This solution start at T equal zero, like being plus infinity. How do you construct it? 
Well, again, you contract, construct it by approximation from below. Okay? Because you remember the time monotonicity. So, what do you do? You take u0 n equal n over omega. There exists there exist a solution u of t n, hmm, which is bounded, which is less or equal than c over t 1 over n minus 1 for all n. So, in particular, letting again n go into infinity, you prove that the solution that starts with n is always bounded, but also that the limit of these solutions or if you want more precise, the, the limit of del infinity, the same reasoning as before, if you want. And this tells you that uh, this solution, which corresponds to this limit, is uniformly bounded for all times. So even the one, and this one is the one that starts from plus infinity. And this is the way of constructing the friendly giant. Curiously enough, this also represents, this also represents the, uh, the asymptotic behavior of all solutions. So all solution at infinity will behave exactly like this, as, I, as we saw in the preview, and as I will show you in the next lectures. Okay, so how do you ensure, okay, here behind, if you do all the computation, it's, um, you see the paper of uh, Vasquez in Monat Shefte, Mathematics, uh, I think it's 2003. Huh? Uh, there is, it's a nice survey, it's in, in the references, and um, it is explained very well and very carefully how to, how to build this. Also in our paper uh, with Sire, which is again in the, in the, in the, in the bibliography at the beginning, uh, there is a construction of the friendly giant for more general operators. So, but the idea is very simple. You start from initial data which approximate plus infinity, which is the simplest one, n. And then, thanks to this uniform estimate, you can guarantee the uh, existence of the limit. By the way, here, how do you prove that there exists a limit? By showing that t, since you know that this quantity is monotone increasing and uniformly bounded, then there exists a pointwise limit for all x. What is the pointwise limit for all x? The solution to the elliptic problem. You deduce it from the equation. Okay? So, there is really, these bounds are really fundamental and are really a part of the porous medium equation in which you see that the nonlinearity makes the things really different from the eight equation. These bounds, absolute bounds, independent of the initial datum, are simply false for the eight equation. Hmm? Because it's linear, so if you take twice the initial data, you expect twice the size of the solution. Here is not the case. If you take twice the initial data, the solution more or less has the same size. Hmm? Okay. Uh, Matteo, so, Matteo. Yes. Matteo, sorry. Thank you for the for the proof. It's very nice. But I, I wanted. Uh, I, I have this question. Uh, yeah, tell me. Do you have also bounds uh, which depends on the initial data? Because uh, yes. depending on yes. the size of the initial data, maybe this bound is not so. Yes. Good. Let me let me now switch to the slide and answer to your question immediately, Alessandro. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, look, look. Anyways, a, a sketch of the proof is here, huh? and um, and then these estimates, as I have written here, are sharp for large times. So this is the correct time decay when t is large. But when t is small, you remember the equation when t is small still remembers of the initial data. So the question of Alessandro really makes sense, no? And uh, and uh, and it has and what Alessandro basically was asking was, is there a sharp, it is the sharp time behavior equal for small and large time? And the answer is no. This is the sharp one for T say big, greater than one or greater than 27. And these kind of smoothing effects, these kind of smoothing effects hold for uh, small times. Well, they hold for all times, but they are sharp only for small times. Okay, and here you see, you cannot forget about the initial data. Hmm? And there is also a short, nice proof of this that I will sketch in one second. Uh, well, I will just sketch because it's a bit 
technical with the exponent. But uh, if you believe that you can you get these exponents, uh, then the proof is really simple too. So you can prove this, which remind which remind of the heat equation. So here, if you see when you let in theta one or in theta one m ten to one, you recover exactly the exponent of the heat equation. So this goes to one and this goes to n over two which is the L1 L infinity smoothing effect for the heat equation. So these are the standard ones, except that we can do it instantaneous. And this is something that the heat equation does not enjoy. Instantaneous smoothing <coughs> effect, it means that whenever you are in L1, you are in L infinity. And this is not true for the heat equation. You have always a bit of delay. You are, I mean, it's, it's not true that if you are in L1, then you are instantaneously in L infinity. Okay, so you can also do a bit better. You can also go backward, but this is something that I will see later. Let me show you just, uh, I have still 10 minutes, right? Um, the, 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 the proof of this, just a sketch of the proof of this. Since I have already the blackboard prepared or with this computation, it is really nice to see how do you proceed, no? So again, again, we start from you, uh, sorry. You start from the um, almost representation formula as, as we did before. So you have this less or equal than two to the m, m minus one divided by t zero integral of u of t zero g of x, uh, sorry, g of x zero. I omit the relevant variables uh, as much as I can. Then here you have the integral over omega. Then what do you do is you split in integral in a small ball, integral around x zero, and integral in a big ball. So you do c divided by t zero integral over b r x zero u of t zero, and you use the estimate on the green function. So you have x minus x zero to the n minus two. The x there is just an s in the case of the fractional Laplacian. Uh, plus same thing integral over b r x zero complementary of u of t zero x minus x zero n minus two dx. So what do you do here? Well, here you do, this is less or equal than c norm of u t zero l infinity on the whole domain, who cares, times t zero, and then you have left the integral of on the ball of this, which is r squared, up to changing the constant here, okay? And then here, what you get, well, here, x minus x zero is greater than r, and then r, so here what you get is r to the n minus two, t zero, and then you're left with the integral of u, t zero, hmm? which is less or equal than the low, this is less or equal than the L1 norm, because it's only on the complement, but it's easy, no? And then you optimize on R and you get the bounds. Uh, you have to make an extra step indeed, no? You have to kill this term. How do you kill this term? Well, just by Young inequality. You put epsilon U of T zero to L infinity to the power M plus one, well, epsilon is, is a bit too much, oops. It's one half, enough. Uh, and here you get a two to some power, and then you get R to the dual of this, which is two M divided by M minus one, divided by T zero to the M over M minus one. Then here you're already plus constant norm of U of T zero, L one divided by R to the N minus two, optimize in R, and you get it. This, of course, you reabsorb it here, taking the soup in x zero. Here, this nothing depends on x zero, so you can take the soup and eliminate this, reabsorb this, and that's it. This is the proof of the smoothing effect. So you see, what I was telling about the, for, uh, the, 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 um, the representation formula is really that it is really useful to get this without doing most iteration, the Georgie technique, or whatever. You just, do this 
estimate uh, integrals at most in uh, well when you want to do the fine boundary behavior you need really to split the integral in four or five parts uh, if it is close to the boundary or not I, maybe tomorrow i will do it in the in the elliptic i will show you a bit where are the crucial point there but it's uh, really easier it's really easier and here the information about the green function is really easy to deduce because the green function the solution of the Dirichlet problem are sub solution of the of the Cauchy problem on the on the whole space on, so the green function is naturally the green function of omega is always less or equal than the green function of rn this holds for all operators and sometimes here it, it is explicit by fourier or by some tricks so really this is really let's say a powerful technique which uh, relies on the study of the linear operator and you exploit these techniques in the nonlinear setting so this is the idea of the class of today. <clears throat> let me just um, um, let me just uh, tell you that you can also do backward. Oops, uh, just full screen. That you can do also backward smoothing effect. This is more a curiosity. And then I wanted, if you allow me, if you allow me five minutes more, I would tell you examples of operator that fit in this theory without changing a line. Just instead of the Laplacian, you put L and everything I did and consider the green function of that operator and everything works. So this is um, uh, the problem that we were studying and our main scope was when we were starting to study fractional Laplacian on domain, Juan Luis told me, can we treat all the fractional Laplacian on domain? And I said, why? There are more than one. The answer was yes, there is more than one. And can, you, can we do it all at the same time? And the, the common framework was exactly this one with the, with the, with the um, green function, which is, is the only common setup in which we can treat all the three operators at the same time without specifying further things. Because for example, the spectral one doesn't have a kernel, explicit kernel. So it's quite complicated in, in the three cases. Uh, I think I am, I think I am done, but we started a bit late, so I can yes, uh, present you today. Have a, you have a four minutes uh, yet, if you want. Okay, so let me let me just finish, uh, and then if uh, if I if I run out of time, I will continue tomorrow. I just wanted to explain you, give you a reminder about the fractional Laplacian on Rn and on domains. Okay, and that's it. It will take five minutes. The the, the standard. The standard the way of defining it is through Fourier transform. So it's an operator. It's an operator that has um, this symbol. Well, so the differential operator with this symbol. Okay, the Laplacian is the case S equal one. It is easy to check. Then, if you look at the book of Stein, for example, you can deduce, you can see that in the case when S is between zero and one, then you can represent it through a singular an hyper singular kernel. What does it mean hyper singular kernel? That I don't have to worry of the integrability at infinity because this tail is integrable. You have to worry of the integra integrability at the, the center of this. So when x is equal to z, if you don't have some cancellation here coming from the function, this integral simply blows up. And this is why you need the principal value. Uh, then there is a third definition, which is the spectral one, which is just you do this, the, 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 spectral, uh, the spectral power the power of uh, the non-negative operators minus Laplacian, and this is what you get. So this is the solution of the heat equation with initial data g of x. You subtract the initial data, and uh, you see here one t is meant to account to to, to get the the, the, the the generator of the semi-group, if you want, for the people who knows what I'm talking about, and then t to the power s is the spectral measure. So the the power s is reflected by this power here on the denominator. Again, you see that also in time, if there is no cancellation here, this integral blows up at zero. It's similar to this. So the S here is the same as, as you have here. Hmm? On our end, these three definitions are equivalent. It's not so easy to see. It's a difficult exercise. If you know how to do it, not so difficult. And um, so, so what happens when you pass to domain? With this the same the domain. Main question. Yes. With the question? same domain. The three. No, no. This is on Rn. Now we want no, to. The domain. Uh, the functions that you can uh, take. To yes. Take. Take this. 
Take the space S, for example, rapidly decreasing functions, smooth, uh, the, the, then by approximation you can prove uh, the, the, the thing. But on, on where you can compute the integrals or the integrals are fine, I show that this is equivalent to this, which is equivalent to this. I give you a hint, to pass from here to here, you have to use the, the formula for the, for the gamma function. So basically this is a repeat, this is the gamma function formula where you put uh, instead of the variable t, the Laplace, mg. I mean, if you know a bit of semi-group structure, this is a trivial formula to get from here. It's a change of variable plus this. There are all tricks. Huh? If, if you don't really put yourself in doing them, you don't, uh, you don't see them, but uh, it's really, it's really, I mean, once, once you have done this exercise, and I think you have to do it by yourself, you will realize that it was not that complicated, or it was quite natural that the three things are the same. Good. What happens in domains? Well, let's see. Of course, the Fourier transform on domain doesn't make sense. The closest thing you can do is Fourier, is Fourier series. So the Fourier transform and the Fourier series still agree. Hmm? And this is what we call the spectral fractional Laplace. And so you run the semi-group formula, you can solve the equations, so the initial data, use a spectral formula, and you get the fractional power of uh, the um, of the standard Laplacian, the Richelieu Laplacian on domain. This is the Laplacian that you study in the classical course of PD, you know? Um, it has eigenvalues which grow in this way, a set of eigenfunctions which behave like the distance to the power uh, one, and uh, the solutions, the, the eigenfunction are as smooth as the boundary allows. So boundary CK imp implies that these are infinite inside and CK up to the boundary, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Green function. Well, these bounds are well known for the green function since the work of Zhang 2002, and maybe before, because uh, he derived them from the eight equation. But you see, this is the structure of the estimate that you expect from the green function. So the same core as in Rn, the same singularity, but then at the boundary, you have an extra singularity and a decay like distance to, the, to some power. And here the power is one. I write gamma because it, gamma it will be the only thing that changes from one Laplacian to the other. Mm -hmm. Lateral boundary condition here are the same. You have just to prescribe zero on the topological boundary because uh, this is a power of uh, the Laplace. So I have an explanation for this in terms of stochastic process I will give you in a second. And then there is the standard fractional Laplace. We call it restricted because we have to distinguish it from the others. And uh, it is simply, you take this function the standard definition of the fractional Laplace is a singular integral on Rn. You're still integrating on Rn, but here you restrict this definition to the function which are supported in omega. So basically you take G0 outside omega. And this is what causes the boundary condition like this. So here the, the boundary condition has to, prescribed, has to be prescribed on the complement of omega. So U has to be zero on the complement of your domain. Already to calculate, to compute the value of the Laplacian at a point, for also for smooth functions, okay? Well, this is a decent self-adjoint operator in L2. It is a discrete spectrum. The eigenvalues grow qualitatively like the one of the spectral Laplacian, but they're smaller. And the eigenfunctions are different because they are not CK up to the boundary, they are just CS. And this is a sharp result by Joachim Sarah and Xavi Rosoton. And it shows you that the, the, the eigenfunction goes like the distance to the power S and there is nothing, and this is sharp, there is nothing you can do about it. So these are, this is a different operator than the previous one. And also the green function behaves differently because you have the same singularity, which accounts for the number of derivatives you are really using. So this is 2s antiderivatives. And then you have the distance, but this time at the power s. And s is less than 1, so this is a different green function. And it gives you a different uh, behavior at the boundary. For the elliptic problem already, we will see it next time. And then we were happy already with these two, and we discovered that there is a third one, which is just when you integrate on omega. The same kernel and you integrate on omega. Here you don't have to specify any restriction. And this is what is called sensored fractional Laplace. And it satisfies the same structure hypothesis on the green function as the other one. But here you see the power is different. It's 2s minus 1. 
And here, we have to restrict S between one half and one. Why? Well, and with this I finish, the difference between these three, these three models can be understood with uh, what I explained as the example of James Bond. Suppose that there is a James Bond in, uh, trapped in the city and he wants to go out. So let me switch to the blackboard and finish with this. So here is your domain. There is your particle, and the particle is allowed to move, no, with stochastic, uh, with um, the Brownian motion, no. If it is the heat equation, what happens? That James Bond wanders around and is caught when it arrives at the boundary. So the process is killed when it reaches the boundary, and this is the standard heat equation for uh, S equal one. What happens when for the spectral, and what happens for the restricted and for the other one? Well, there are two things you can do here to transform this in a local equation. You can subordinate and kill. This is the one which is called kill upon touching the boundary. So when James Bond tries to escape the city and arrives to the border of the city, is caught by the police. Stop, end of the story. This is the boring it equation. But you know, James Bond is smart, so maybe he can jump from one place to another, he can take subway, subway trains and so on, and he can try to escape. So, if you first subordinate and then kill, what you obtain is the restricted fractional Laplacian. So what does it mean? That you allow the particle to jump. And when do you kill them? So subordination means that you change the time scale such that in the same amount of time, I can, I can move in a different, in a different uh, space, in a different quantity of space. So you can jump from one place to another. Can you jump outside? Yes, you can jump outside, he can try to escape, and he's almost done, but he's caught upon landing. So James Bond escaped the city, he was allowed to cross the boundary here, I don't know, he took a plane, for example, but he was caught at the airport. Okay, so these are subordinated, so I can fly outside the domain and I am killed upon landing. Hmm? While the first, the spectral fractional Laplacian, it was already confined, so I can jump randomly here, but I cannot go because I, the particle who wanted to go out were already killed. So spectral fractional Laplacian is killing and then subordinate. So first you restrict the movement and then you allow jumps. And then there is the third one, which is the sensor at fractional Laplacian, which corresponds to a sensor game. So suppose that your particle arrives to the boundary. It arrives here. No? at the boundary, and then there is a censorship here appearing. So you flip a coin and it had the 50% of probability to stay inside, the 50% of probability to go outside. And this is exactly what the censorship means. So if it was going to stay inside, then nothing happens. You leave the motion go. If it was going to, uh, to go outside, then you reflect the movement. So you force him to stay inside. And this is the censorship, okay? And this explains heuristically why S in that case is to be less than one half, because these functions, this function RH1, uh, RHS, and we know that you lose the trace, the L2 trace exactly at S equal one half in the HS spaces. I mean, these functions are just HS functions, and so you cannot play this probabilistic game if you don't have a well-defined trace here. And this is why we have this. Uh, the authors of this model, which are Bogdan and uh, Chen and Burzi, and everything is written in the transparencies, uh, tell that when S is less than one half, this corresponds to Neumann condition. So it's a kind of condition in which you say you have a normal derivative zero but in which sense is, it's a bit unclear. I, I never succeeded in understanding really the details there because it's a probabilistic language. It's really difficult to understand. But this is what most of the people call a regional ablation. Okay? So with this, I will finish the, the class and all these operators are included in the theory and they constitute and much more of them. We will see more tomorrow. Thank you very much for your attention and sorry for- uh, Thank you very much, Matteo.